This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the uh, fourth lecture on books of prime entry. Uh, but as I said at the end of the previous, uh, at the end of the last lecture, um, nothing new here. I just want to, if you like, draw a picture of where all the books fit together, uh, which, which I'm hoping will be of help. If you are copying me, then I am going to use the whole page. Uh, there's a blank page, paragraph five in, in, in the notes. Uh, but I'll start in the middle. Because if you remember, the first thing we do is record in one of four books. We've got a cash receipts book. That's supposed to look like a book. Uh, a cash payments book. I'm sorry, I have no choice but to squash a bit, obviously. Uh, a purchase day book or purchase journal. Uh, and a sales day book or a sales journal. I mentioned earlier, I will mention again later, there can be more books, but these are the main four, which would apply to just about any business. Now, these books are known as books of prime entry. Uh, prime means first in this context, so this is the first place we make a record of every transaction. And do remember, these are not double entry. There's no debit, there's no credit, they're simply lists. At the same time as we're writing up those books, we're taking information from the books, taking the figures from the books, uh, and writing up the payables or purchases ledger and the sales or receivables ledger where we're keeping a note for each supplier, each customer. And so we've got a receivables or sales ledger. Well, we've got accounts for Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C, and so on. Uh, we've also got um, a payables or purchase ledger. Got an account for Mrs. X, Mrs. Y, Mrs. Z, and so on. But two books with, again, uh, uh, pages for each customer and each supplier. And what we're doing is taking information, take copying the numbers. So um, the, the sales ledger, we're taking information from the sales day book. That tells us how much somebody owes us. And we're taking information from the cash receipts book. How much they've paid us. And we can keep track of them all. Uh, similarly, the payables or the purchase ledger take uh, information from the purchase day book. That's how much we owe people. That's what we bought. Take information from the cash payments book. That's how much we paid them. So the dotted line that we're taking information. Uh, these books, and, uh, I'll put it in brackets because it's very old fashioned. We used to call these personal ledgers. I'll put in brackets because I doubt those words are used anymore, but we used to go on a person, you know, it's Mr. A, Mrs. X and so on. Uh, much more importantly though, again, there is no double entry. Or the other expression, we say they're memorandum only. Memorandum note only. 
So all of that's going on during the month. At the end of the month, that's when we do the double entry. Then this is where we've got our real T accounts. We've got the cash account. We've got the purchases account. We've got the payables account and so on. And what do we do? We take information, take the totals from these four books. And so Purchase Day book, for instance, we take the total and we debit purchases, we credit payables. And there is the actual double entry. So we get the totals from those four books, but we actually do the debits, credits, and the nominal ledger. So um, where are we? This is the nominal or general ledger. And of course, this is double entry. And finally, of course, if I can try to change the colour here, finally, it's from um, the nominal ledger that we then carry on and would produce the financial statements. Uh, and so there we are. I, I don't know if that helps or not. I hope it does, but it just sort of summarises. Um, but as I've said several times, your problem is not one of writing up the books, but it's remembering the names. It is so confusing. Uh, I said before, a payables account, payables ledger, payables journal. However, obviously it may be here as I've been going through it. I'm sure you can see why, you know, your head starts spinning, if you're at all unsure. All right, just a couple of tiny things before I um, stop this lecture. I had four books of prime entry. Um, th those four would apply to virtually any business. But you can have more books. It depends on the business. For instance, uh, some companies uh, deal in cash in different currencies. You know, they may deal... Um, and their transactions, some transactions in dollars, some transactions in UK pounds. So fine. They may have a cash receipts book for dollars and a cash receipts book for pounds. No problem. Uh, other companies, they may have a lot of um, customers who return goods. Now, I'll deal with the double entry when there are returns in a later chapter. It's easy. But just as they've got a book listing every time we sell goods on credit. Fine, if lots of people return goods, maybe they've got another book where they'll list um, goods returned. There's no limit. What, uh, it depends on the type of business. They'll have a book of prime entry for each major type of transaction. Uh, for odd ones, they might have a book called a journal, but Forgive me, I'm dealing with that again in a separate chapter. One book I will mention here, though, is to do with cash. So far, I've used the word cash to mean money in any sense. What I'm getting at is I think most businesses, most of their receipts, most of their payments are in and out of the bank. But of course, they may, particularly a shop, may have received some payments in loose cash, coins. And in that case, uh, they may have two sets of cash books. Um, the main cash receipts, cash payments book for money in and out of the bank. But another book for money in and out of loose cash. And that's called the Petty Cash Book. The word petty means small. And this, is, this would record uh, cash 
receipts and payments, of what I'm calling loose cash. I think you know what I mean. Coins, etc. Now, of course, for a shop, this is uh, likely to be where most of the cash is coming in and out. Uh, for a shop, you know, they make sales, and so, you know, perhaps today I made sales of 5,000. Debit cash, credit sales, 5,000. Although a shop, of course, although most of their money is coming in loose cash, I think what most shops will do is at the end of the day, they put most of that money into the bank. They may keep a bit left over, you know, they've only got change for tomorrow, but maybe we've come to the end of the day and they say, oh, let's go and put 4,900 into the bank. So when they put the coins into the bank, they'll credit petty cash because it's gone out of their cash machine and they'll debit the main cash Petty cash. Uh, because you're now 4,900 in the bank. Uh, that leaves them with 100 in their cash machine in the shop. Uh, as I say, they, they'll usually leave a little bit so that the next morning they can give change to customers, you know, pay with a big note or something. Uh, and that balance in loose cash, you'll often see, is called the float. All right, now that's a shop. There's not much involved there. Uh, however, other types of business, I would imagine, unless you work in a shop, uh, the business you're in, most of the money will be in and out of the bank. But a lot of businesses... Uh, do keep a little bit of cash in the office, loose cash, so that, you know, if they suddenly run out of coffee or they run out of toilet rolls or something, um, they've got, you know, perhaps $50 in loose cash, so they can always go and use a bit to buy toilet rolls. Or somebody comes to um, collect money for charity. You know, you're not going to take cash out of the bank. Uh, but if we've got a tin with some loose cash in, you can give them a bit. And so it's very common for big businesses to have a little bit of cash. And they might say, oh, well, things like toilet rolls, coffee and things, we spend about $100 a month, a week. And so let's take 100 out of the bank. Credit cash, debit petty cash. And there's a hundred ready to spend on little things. So during the week, you know, maybe oh, we spend ten dollars uh, on coffee, or ten dollars to the cleaner, credit petty cash, debit cleaning. Or maybe we spend twenty dollars on. To a charity, somebody comes collecting for charity, credit cash, debit, charity, 20, and so on. Now, the reason I'm going on here is that if you do have a tin in the office with cash in, it's the easiest thing for someone to steal. You know, there are all sorts of ways of employees managing to steal money from the company, uh, but it can get quite complicated not to be found out, but if there's a tin with $100 sitting in it, it's terribly tempting. You know, and the person who looks after the tin is often paid very badly. So you've got somebody who's not paid much sat there with a, a tin full of money. There's obviously a risk that they may end up stealing it. And so you make sure there's not too much money in the tin. You know, if there's only $100 in the tin, uh, two things. Firstly, even if they're not paid very well, I think 
they're unlikely to risk losing their job just for a hundred dollars. And also, even if they do steal it, for a big company who's making profits, you know, in tens of thousands, a hundred dollars isn't going to collapse the, com uh, collapse the company. But there is one danger. Suppose that was the first week. At the end of the week, there's 70 left in the tin. And what often happens, now you may think this is stupid, but it happened, it's happened a lot in real life. It's the person in charge of petty cash comes to me, if I'm in charge, comes to me at the end of the week and says, ah, we need some more loose cash. Can we have another hundred? And I think, oh, a hundred's reasonable. I thought we'd spend about a hundred a week. And so I sign the forms to get another hundred from the bank. There's now 170 in the tin. And next week, maybe they spend, ooh, 50. Credit, cash, debit, wherever, cleaning, whatever it is. And so much is left. 120. Oh, sorry, what am I talking? Is that right? Yes, it is. There's 120 left. And again, they come and say, ah, oh, we're running out of cash at the end of the week. Can we have another 100? I say, fine. I thought we'd spend 100 a week. And of course, there's now 220. Now, you can see what's happening. You see, I've got to, I'm trying to run a big business. This is just a hundred dollars. I know we'll spend about a hundred dollars a week. So I keep saying, oh, fine, here's another hundred. And then one day, the person in charge of this disappears. And so does the tin. And I say, oh dear, you yeah. know, oh well. At least it can't have got away with much. But trouble is, you can see what's happening. Started with a hundred. And they went up to 170. Now they're up to 220. They can carry on like this and cleverly manage to end up with several thousand in the tin. And then, of course, they disappear with several thousand. And when I come to investigate, I think, oh, good heavens. You know, I thought the most we could lose was 100. But out of control. Now, uh, that might seem such a stupid thing to happen, but it does happen. And the solution is really easy. What should happen is this. The first week, they spent 30, the 70 left. They come to me and say, can we have more uh, petty cash? And I say, show me what you've spent. Bring the receipts. And they say, oh, we've spent 30. And I say, fine, you can have another 30. And there's now a hundred. Uh, next week they spend fifty. Credit, cash, debit, cleaning, whatever it is. And so there's fifty left. And they come at the end of the week and say, can I have more cash? And I say, yes. Show me the receipts for what you've spent this week. Oh, they've spent fifty. So you can have another fifty. And now it's back to 100 and so on. And that's what should happen. And doing that, making sure each week I give them the same amount that they've spent, means that the most that's ever in the tin is 100. And therefore that's the most I could ever lose. And what happened before obviously couldn't happen where they keep managing to get it higher and higher. Well, be aware of that. It's in the syllabus. You could be tested on it. Not doing um, the debits credits, but just being aware of what it is. It's called the impressed system of petty cash. I'm afraid I've no idea why it's called impressed. But that's the way any business that's carrying petty cash, that's the way they should operate. 
So I hope that little example made it clear, but do read uh, what I've written on the last page of this chapter. I did up the Petty Cash book, where it's just saying in words what, what I've tried to explain now. All right, so it was quite a long chapter, sorry, but um, well, I hope it was all clear.